Hi there, I'm Michaela Esquivel. Thank you to the moderators um, for your assistance today. Today, as discussed, I'll be discussing new technologies. Does EndoFlip help with intraoperative assessment? I have nothing to disclose today. There's my seven seconds, because I was told I needed seven seconds. Oh. Today's objectives, I'll be going over an introduction to EndoFlip, um, its technology, how to use and interpret EndoFlip, current clinical applications, current bariatric applications, um, assessment of a study that's evaluating intraoperative application in bariatric surgery, as well as ongoing studies in future directions. So introduction to EndoFlip. EndoFlip is an endoluminal functional lumen imaging probe, EndoFlip. It's an impeded splenometry system. And as you can see from this image on the right here, it's a catheter with a balloon at the tip that for our purposes would be placed across the GE junction and inflated with fluid. Electrodes on the catheter and the balloon measure impedance of a current between 16 electrodes within the catheter. They can calculate the diameter, the cross-sectional area, the pressure of a hollow viscous in real time. So the relationship or the ratio of the cross-sectional area and pressure can be evaluated and calculated as the distensibility index or an assessment of stiffness or compliance. So with endoflip, we can assess diameter, pressure, distensibility, motility, and really look at dynamic changes of all of these in real time. It can be used in the esophagus, the lower esophageal sphincter, the pylorus, the anus, and more. So I won't be going in full detail in this um, busy table here, but it's important to note that there's two endoflip catheters, an 8-centimeter and a 16-centimeter catheter, and they have different fill volumes and protocols for use. Um, I personally use a 16-centimeter catheter, catheter for all um, esophageal assessment, um, predominantly um, during intraprocedure for a poem, and the 8-centimeter for assessment of the pylorus during a gastric or pyloric poem, um, but 8-centimeter is frequently used at the EG junction as well. So looking at the image here on the left, you can see the catheter across the ED junction and the balloon inflated um, within the esophagus. And here in the center, we see a real-time kind of instant image of what you will see on the actual device. Um, this is a depiction of what the screen looks like. So you can inflate, deflate the catheter, um, pause the image, save the image, measurements can all be recorded. And on the right here, this is EndoFlip 2.0. It's one of the newer models where you can look at the changes over time. So it looks a lot like manometry. We'll be looking at some images of that a bit later. Um, and this here on the right is what the actual console looks like um, that you can have um, by the patient's um, head during endoscopy. And so even just visibly looking at these images, you see this on the right that you can see a tighter, lower distensibility, lower diameter LES compared to the one on the left. And we'll go over some numbers here shortly, but you can have the immediate measurements of diameter, distensibility, um, and pressure with the, each image. And then here, in terms of motility, a huge, huge benefit of endoflip is this looks a lot like esophageal manometry. So on the left here, we see what we considered normal. So we have um, evidence of repetitive anterograde contractions that you can see over time while using endoflip. In the center here, we have evidence of achalasia, type 1 achalasia. You have absent esophageal body con um, contractions with high pressure, low distensibility LES. And on the right, we can see evidence of an EG outflow obstruction, so repetitive antegrade as well as repetitive retrograde contractions with a high pressure, low distensibility LES. So huge benefits in terms of looking at motility. But how to interpret? So in addition to looking at the images as shown, um, what do the numbers mean and how do we actually use those and put those into action? So looking at the bottom portion here, just at the normal, um, at the, at the normal column here. For the EG junction, distensibility index of over three and 2.8 in some studies is considered normal, while um, the diameter of over 18 millimeters is also considered normal. And again, when looking at motility, we would anticipate repetitive anti-grade contractions. And again, very busy table, but I think useful as a reference is that when you look at the numbers, including distensibility, diameters, as well as motility of the esophagus, you can start hypothesizing, theorizing exactly what's going on with someone and even start diagnosing them um, just with the endo flip. And so if you look at the left column here, distensibility of zero to two, so quite low, lower than we'd expect for a normal patient um, with motility changes and, and abnormalities. And that's something that's consistent with achalasia, more severe achalasia with a darker orange. You go to the right side of this table, we had distensibility even above nine, and even with some motility abnormalities, um, you know, predisposing patients to even worsening reflux, you have patients that you might see that are predisposed to reflux. Not necessarily diagnostic, but something that you'd have high on your suspicion. 
So clinical uses of Indoflip, it's definitely used as an adjunct in terms of diagnostic uh, modality for patients with motility disorders. Um, for our purposes, predominantly used um, in the foregut. But we also can use Indoflip um, for those surgeons and endoscopists and, th you know, therapeutic uses as well, for achalasia, during hiatal hernia repair, um, during a pyloric myotomy. And so there are several studies out there that try to look at the use of Indoflip and how it can predict outcomes. If we can find a protocol that we can repeat, if we can find numbers that we can aim for. Um, and this consensus study looks at the intraoperative use of, usage of Indoflip in various um, procedures and you know something that we can attempt to mimic within the bariatric surgery world. So here on the left, we look at hyal hernia repair, laparoscopic hyal hernia repair um, and fundoplication. Um, studies show that uh, with a distensibility index after fund application of 2 to 3.5 gave patients the best control of their reflex with the lowest risk of dysphagia. As you can imagine, under 2 or a lower distensibility, you'd have higher risk of dysphagia. Over 3.5, patients had higher risk of, of um, ongoing GERD. And then the middle and the right column for patients with achalasia, and if has been used for both laparoscopic color myotomy as well as POEM, with the goal distensibility ideally above 3, 3.5 if possible, um, resulted in the, the best improvement of dysphagia symptoms for achalasia, while a distensibility under around 8 or 8.5 resulted in the lowest risks of GERD. So really exciting that you could, in theory, use some of these numbers, use endoflip during a procedure to even alter the course of your procedure, make a bigger myotomy, adjust your rep. And again, here's some images that you would see in a procedure. On the left, a poem, pre-myotomy, visibly you can see a lower distensibility versus post-myotomy. And then after hiatal hernia and fundoplication, you progressively see from hiatal hernia repair to curl closure to fundoplication, a slow decrease in distensibility as well as diameter. So how can Indoflip be used for bariatric patients? You know, I took the time to describe Indoflip as well as, you know, I thought it was important to show clinical applications because it will help us, you know, better use this technology, I think, for our bariatric patients. But what can be done and what has been done? So um, these next two studies are really looking post-operatively, but also intriguing to see some applications. So post-sleeve gastrectomy patients who experience stenosis, Indoflip was used during endoscopic um, pneumatic balloon dilation, was applied immediately prior to dilation and immediately after dilation. And though it was a very small study, N of 10, um, those patients who were responders who essentially had complete symptom resolution after dilation had a statistically significant difference in their diameters from 19 versus 13 as well as their distensibility index of 21 versus 4. So 21 being wide open, 4 with some room for improvement. And so, you know, again, no protocols developed from this, small um, N, but again, it might, you know, um, predict post-procedure what these patients may experience, as well as change your actual intra-procedure course. And then the application of Endoflip for post renoid gastric bypass pa patients who experienced weight regain. Um, in this study, it was a retrospective review, um, 21 patients, so again, small n, but essentially looked at um, Endoflip in comparison, you know, in comparison to actual proceduralist assessment of the gastrojejunal anastomosis diameter. And it found that the visual estimation by a very experienced endoscopist actually overestimated on the average of four millimeters, or just over four millimeters, compared to the objective endoflip measurements of diameter, which can have clinical implications in terms of how you might manage a patient post my gastric bypass. And in addition, there were some patients who had a normal GJ anastomosis diameter, though had very high distensibility, and these patients were experiencing weight regain. So again, no protocols established, no new norms established, my needs in this patient population. Um, but I, uh, you know, technically you're identifying a new previously unrecognized subgroup who may benefit from intervention that would otherwise not be seen. So looking big picture at endoflip and GERD. So some of the studies shown previously after hiatal hernia and POEM, looking at the assessment of GERD were post-procedure. Um, but looking at endoflip, you know, we know that endoflip is used to assess GE junction distensibility, as well as esophageal motility, which as discussed before, poor clearance may be a risk factor for reflux for any patient, but particularly post-sleeve gastrectomy. And these are two of the many factors that maybe may contribute to GERD.
but the data is mixed. And so there are numerous studies out there um, and, and they're conflicting, essentially. So some studies show that a very high distensibility over eight to nine may be related to GERD. While others say, well, no, it's not the distensibility, it's actually the motility of the esophagus that correlates with, with reflex symptoms. And then in addition, there are many studies that say there's no correlation, even patients with Barrett's esophagus, patients that are symptomatic with reflex, and there's no correlation with distensibility. And so it further proves that reflex is a very complex, multifactorial process. But how can we use this for our bariatric patients, particularly intraoperatively, is the question we have today. So this study aimed to look at just that. Um, it's an intraoperative assessment using endoflip and sleeve gastrectomy patients. Um, N is small of 15, mean age was 51, BMI of 45, um, with a follow-up of three months for all patients, six months for some. And the main primary outcome measurement was the use of the GERD health-related quality of life questionnaire. So during this study, intraoperatively, um, endoflip was used immediately prior to sleeve gastrectomy formation, immediately post-sleeve gastrectomy formation, all with pneumoperitoneum in place of 15 millimeters of mercury. And so findings show a statistical dif difference between the pre and post sleeve distensibility. So 1.2 pre-sleeve, 2.2 post-sleeve. Um, is that from disruption of our sling fibers? Is it a change in the angle of hiss? But there's an absolute difference between those patients. And you might be thinking that's a really low number, that's below the three threshold, but that's due to the pneumoperitoneum. Um, but ultimately, the study found zero correlation between these distensibility changes and reflux. So again, these are limitations. It's a small study, um, only 15 participants. It's an overall very short follow-up period. There was no assessment of motility. Um, again, pneumoperitoneum is used, and so any sort of post-operative EGD and endoflip assessment would be very hard to compare um, with these patients. And it had a technically uh, an outcome measure um, that's subjective and a single outcome measure. So ongoing evaluation is absolutely needed, and there's actually an ongoing clinical trial, trial out of the Mayo Clinic entitled Prediction of Post-Laparoscopic Sleeve Gastrectomy GERD with Endoflip. Um, so the goal is to have 200 participants um, and prior to sleeve gastrectomy in the preoperative period to undergo EGD and Endoflip. Follow these patients for five years with, again, the primary outcome being worsening or new onset GERD, again, using the GERD um, Health-Related Quality of Life Questionnaire and the secondary outcome. Um, regarding new onset dysphagia. So much improvement in terms of the N as well as the follow-up, so I think something that we're all gonna be looking forward to down the line, um, but definitely ongoing studies are needed in multiple rounds. So back to the question, does endoflip help with intraoperative assessment? So with our current data, intraoperative assessment and intraoperative use of endoflip, it's too early to say. You know, it would definitely be too early to say with any sort of endoflip findings that we'd change our, our preoperative plan for a, a bariatric surgery patient. We'd definitely not be doing that at this point. But again, we do know that endoflip is incredibly useful to determine our LES sensibility and compliance incredibly useful determinant of esophageal motility. Again, two factors that may play a role. And in particular, our sleeve gastrectomy patients who may you know, have increased intragastric pressure postoperatively, these two measures may have a bigger impact for this specific patient population um, long-term down the line. So future directions. A lot of questions remain, a lot of studies are still needed. Is the time to use endoflip during the preoperative assessment as that um, upcoming clinical trial? Should endoflip be used for all patients or just patients with reflux or patients without reflux? And should endoflip be used you know, in combination with another um, objective tool, such as a pre or Bravo capsule? And should that be preoperative as well as postoperative surveillance? As we discussed, there are, there's silent GERD, and, and if we can prevent patients from having ramifications of that earlier, that's likely better for them. And so ongoing research regarding endoflip, its accepted indications, establishment of new protocols, um, establishment of normal ranges, as well as emerging applications is absolutely still needed and I think warranted within bariatric surgery. Thank you.